Hello viewers, a uh, very warm welcome to your weekly State of Affairs program here on QTV. I am Alu Sise and I'm here with my co-host Mr. Mudmuch. Mr. Mudmuch, good to have you here once again. I'm, I'm glad to be here, Alu. Well, Cheers. thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mudmuch. Well, viewers, uh, like I said, I mean, you're watching QTV, the Gambia's first private TV station, and we are broadcasting from our studios here on Kairaba Avenue. I mean, this is your weekly State of Affairs program. I mean, it is just uh, last Saturday we saw Gambians with the polls to vote in the first phase of the local government elections. In this case, uh, they were voting for the councillors across uh, 120 wards. Surprisingly, we have seen, I mean, some sort of mixed feelings, I mean, mixed uh, results as far as the election is concerned. I mean, the, the ruling National People's Party of President Barrow was able to win, I mean, 52 seats out of the 120. I mean, this is from zero. I mean, in the last election, NPP was in, in existence. I mean, first outing, 52 seats. I mean, the leading uh, opposition party, that's the United Democratic Party, I mean, winning 45 seats from 62 seats that they won in the last election. I mean, APRC, I mean, winning five seats from 18 that they won in the last election. National uh, Reconciliation Party, that's NRP, won four. GDC, five from the 23 that they won in the last election. PDYS, one seat. Independent, one seat. And the NATO Alliance uh, also got seven uh, seats. It, it, it's, it's quite interesting looking looking at the results. I mean, we've seen, I mean, the NPP seems to be doing much better in the in rural Gambia, uh, even though we have seen some changes as far as Bangu is concerned. And then the United Democratic Party also did wonders in, in West Coast region, KM and uh, Lower River region. And of course, I mean, this was, I mean, we've seen uh, quite uh, low voter turnout as well. I mean, out of the 900 and 62,157 registered voters that we have, I mean, only 243,899 turned out to vote, which represents only 25%. We're joining us this week to discuss these and other issues around this election is no one but uh, Seth Mati Jao, who is the executive director of the Center for Research and Policy Development. Seth Mati, good to have you on this program. Uh, thank you, Alu, and hi, Boj. Yes. I'm happy to be yeah. here. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I know you, you were busy with your team in the field, monitoring, mm -hmm. observing how the process went. I mean, just to start with, I mean, your, your impression about the election. Well, I think, I mean, I must start by congratul congratulating Gambians again. I think this is another successful election. I mean, despite um, the, the low voter turnout, I think things went orderly. And, and, and this also shows, is a testament to... Um, our democratic maturity as we continue to to consolidate our democracy um, like you said we we observed the the process we saw um, some some hitches here and there um, but mostly what was noticed and I think everyone noticed that was the low voter turnout and I think that was really serious uh, but it also this speaks to the fact that um, local government uh, for the longest, they always has received the, the lowest voter turnout in the country. Um, I'm, I'm not sure why, um, uh, but I think these are things, important questions that we need to uh, interrogate. I'm talking about the, 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 the low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. In the last election, we had 34%. This time, like I said, just around 25%. Uh, mm -hmm. Aside from the obvious fact, people will tend to blame the Ramadan and other stuff. Uh, what do you think went wrong? I mean, why do you think people are, are in building interest? In yeah, I mean, um, for me, I think, you know, those that use Ramadan as is just an excuse. I mean, Ramadan will not stop you from doing what you have to do. And so especially when it comes to a national duty, that is, you know, that comes almost every five years. So Ramadan cannot be an excuse for me. Uh, but I think generally is one um, that has to do with a, the, the lack of understanding of um, the, the council or the important role that council have to play. And I think historically, not only in Gambia, but in many places, local government usually tend to attract the, you know, the lowest voters. Um, and I think this has to do with also the fact that people generally tend to rank um, elections where the presidency is seen as the most important national assembly somewhat. And then, you know, you have local government, which people really um, sometimes do not care, mostly in this country. But I think also, um, you know, it has to do with the fact, uh, despite the fact that uh, councillors live with the people. Still, people don't know their councillors. And and I was talking to some people, they were not voting because they did not know their councillors. And uh, I also think that the, the media attention that was also given to the presidential, that was also given to uh, the National Assembly could not be given to the local government because the candidates were many, but it was also too local uh, in the sense that um, that might have um, um, caused the 
reason why people did not turn out. But for me, basically, uh, it must be lack of interest as a, you know, but I think there needs to be further studies and investigation to, to ask people why they refuse to, to turn out. But for me, I don't see interest. I think the problem is interest. Uh, I mean, uh, you, you just had me give a breakdown of the, of the, of the results. Mm -hmm. I mean, which party won what seat? I mean, are you surprised by the results? Well, I mean, I, I wasn't, I, I'm not surprised, but I also, I, I understand that this country's political landscape is dynamic. I mean, there is no one party that can say, you know, that uh, people, people are free to choose uh, whoever they want to, want, to, want to choose. But I was expecting that perhaps um, the, you know, based on what we were saying that um, NPP is going to come and, you know, um, contest heavily, especially in urban areas. We did not, uh, I did not see that. Uh, but I also saw strongly that NPP did well um, in the rural community. So for me, it's also creating another um, sort of understanding that is somehow similar to what happened in the National Assembly election, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, um, NPP did not do well in the urban areas, but did well in the rural communities. And this is exactly what has uh, somehow repeated in the, in the local government, in the local government election. Um, I, I also thought that UDP, you know, given the fact that they're also very grounded, um, you know, in terms of um, having bases across the country, I thought they were also going to do even even better than that that the, that they did because I mean, comparing all these parties, they are they are more formidable at the at the grassroots. Yeah. So so I mean, what do you think? Uh is responsible having the NPP not doing well in KM and in, in, in West Coast region, the most densely populated. You have quite good number of uh, voters. Even the one will say, okay, there was this low voter turnout. What does this tell about about the party? Well, MPP is not strong here. I don't know what they, what why. Maybe I mean, and you hear them doing quite a, 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 a lot of work on the ground. But they're not strong in the in the urban area. They but they won landslide in the in the presidential election. In, yeah, yeah. In both presidential West Coast is, and is you know presidential is different from things that have to do with the community. You know, uh, during the presidential it was few candidates and you know you had the incumbent. But when it comes to now issues that are to be decided by the community and members from that community, usually people that have track record, people with what we call social capital. These are usually people that are um, mostly elected. Um, but if you look at also NPP's candidate compared to others, I mean, in terms of their profiling, you feel like other candidates were even way stronger. But for me, I think the challenge, especially in the urban area, has to do with their um, campaign strategy. Um, perhaps uh, what are the issues that NPP is standing for? What are they talking to, to the communities? Because already here, we are seeing alternatives. Uh, we've seen alternatives in KMC, which is dominated by an uh, opposition stronghold. And then you've seen what um, you know it's been done in in, in Good Campo, for instance. Uh, we, at some point, we saw that Sri Kusumpo decided to join. So there are a lot of other, those kind of factors that um, perhaps are playing. But perhaps also is the is like I mentioned the campaign strategy. I mean, for me also, I look at the the campaign managers of both both parties, for instance. You know, you cannot compare definitely you cannot compare more salary despite whatever you have to say. Uh, with, with the campaign manager of NPP. You know, also is more grounded. I mean, more grounded, more grassroots focused. And despite you disagree, he's able to bring other people on, on their side. I'm not saying he entirely contributed, but that could be other factor. But for me also, is the fact that even though NPP is a breakaway of UDP, we can say that and then um, um, consequently uh, the culmination of all other um, um, party runaways. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you see already UDP had those pains. So they were already in existence. So MPP was supposed to come and uh, and pick from that, uh, which made it difficult for them. So um, so so they need to change. But I think also comparing the rural urban here, people are closer to information. Uh, people are tend to be more aware um, of the role of government because we see almost of the challenges that are happening every day, the high cost of living. You know, all those are factors. And, uh, just before Mr. Ngoj comes in, we have seen in Bangu that it's a soup change. We have seen uh, from what happened in the parliamentary election, NPP lost all the mm -hmm. seats in Bangu. Mm -hmm. But in this election, we have seen they have won seven out of nine uh, uh, votes. Well, yeah, yeah, where, where did they get it right this time? Well, I think it's the candidates. I mean, if you look at Daba, I mean, for instance, he was yeah, independent. Daba, yeah. Yes, um, he was independent and then um, he joined NPP. So I think the candidates, in terms of their social capital, is also very very clear to that. And I think the other one that I saw was also works. Uh, Waka, um, I'm not sure what the name again is, 
but you know the, the kind of candidate you you go for it also matters and and i think that's where also in other places that's where you need to have an edge over over them because the candidates that they that they put in games for instance most of them were sitting already so they've been doing quite well in their own communities um so so for me i think in Bandu the difference there is the is the candidate um and and, and Bandu also is a is a neat, close knit society also, and perhaps that could be the difference. I'm saying Mr. Mbali is not the same, he's from Bandu, it's obvious. He's a double dog, he's a community. That's it, Bandu. But I mean, the politics in Bandu is very. Well, you know what I mean, Mr. Mbali was nodding the head. I mean, I'm saying, Mati, um, the way you started by congratulating Gambia to be so well, never really known. Violence, never had that But for the voter turnout, my congratulations, not, not quite there. Yeah. Yeah. there. But let me tell, let me tell you something. My taxi episode, it was on Sunday after the um, um, elections. It's fantastic when you use these taxis, yeah. taxis, and you listen to people, mm -hmm. you know, what their concerns are and how they're arguing yes. about things. So one of them said, so why do you think that there's been such a low turnout? Um, the other one said, well, what do these people do for us? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the benefit? <laughs> As it were. So we now sort of winner takes all kind of yeah. politics. Mm -hmm. We know that the president matters. Yeah. In fact, the other lady said, actually, you should vote for the candidate who is in the party in power. Mm -hmm. The was with money to do something. Mm -hmm. It was an extraordinary yeah. kind of yeah. thinking. Yeah. So, so, so this is it. So what do you make of this? Um, with the presidential, we saw the winning margin, Barrow's winning margin mm -hmm. over Dabo. Mm -hmm. In the National Assembly, from 31 to 15, mm -hmm. now the councils, mm -hmm. 62, 44. Mm -hmm. What is going on? The new kid on the block is establishing itself. Is the old stager, UDP, receding? Have we seen a sea change in our politics? Well, I mean, I, I, I you know, it, things are still evolving. That's what I, that's what I can say. And, um, and, and right now, what is clear is that we have two dominant parties. Mm. And that is NPP and and, and, and and UDP, even though NPP is the is the newest. But you also realize that the way NPP is founding is mostly I mean taking people from other political parties. Uh, so for, for me, I think there is a um, our political landscape is changing, especially at the local level. But then at the national level, I think factors, I mean, there are different factors or different considerations that people um, give to the candidates that are there. Um, Barrow was seen more as a unifier um, compared to to Dabo perhaps, and 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 so so these are issues that also um, can 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 definitely count. But at the local level, you know, I also heard a lot of people, you know, especially with the with the local council saying, um, you know, these people don't do anything for us after, like even mm -hmm. the last Afrobarometer, we saw 73% yeah. of the population had no contact exactly. with the councils. Yeah. And we, these people are living in the community, they're supposed to be there for the people, and yet less contact. But then the other problem is what? The structure of our governance system. I mean, councils collect revenue, but to what extent are they given that power or even do they have extra money so that they can help bring development to the communities? And this is what they're supposed to do. But generally for me, what I'm seeing in terms of the political landscape is like two dominant parties emerging. Uh, it's too early to say that this is gonna be the, the I mean, th that it's gonna influence the 2026 or so. But I think we are seeing signs of um, NPP and UDP becoming um, very strong in this country. And even if you compare with other political parties, you see those that had seats now, they also, um, um, declining. And so I'm not sure whether I answered your question mm -hmm. well, but for me, I think it's still here and there. Um, but um, we, are seeing, we are seeing the signs. Uh, we are seeing the signs of two parties um, emerging. And perhaps at some point, we'll all be forced to pick between the two parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's it. Um, sort of, um, people have been talking about um, the KMC, mm -hmm. BAC, mm -hmm. NDP didn't do well. Uh, but even in Nigeria, when you look around, then do you tend to see that the urbanites yep. tend to be sort of more sophisticated, perhaps, tend to be more skeptical. So incumbents, in a way, tend to lose these urban votes, mm -hmm. but they'll probably take the, the, the hinterland. This, this has been um, um, a, a pattern that we, we, we are seeing. So one wonders, we're talking about two parties. Let, let's analyze here, um, mm -hmm. Saint Mati, the, the, the idea of the party system. Because it appears to me 
that most of the voters are really floating voters. Yeah. The UDP or NPP, you will have your core yeah. voters. We discussed this, mm -hmm. yeah. but they are small. Yeah. They cannot win no, no, no. any yeah. election um, 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 for, for you. Yeah. What do we make of this sort of floaters not committed to any party? We've discussed it. Is it the, yeah. the, the fact that parties really do not have any glue, ideological glue, simply depends on the personality? On the day, I, I, I think here the personality counts more than mm. ideology or anything. Um, and I think also even the way that parties are formed. I'm not saying all parties. There are mm. parties that are formed by you know a collective. Mm -hmm. um, if you compare our party system or even the way that they are formed with Europe, where like for instance you talk about the Labour Party, you know the idea is about what the working class. You know the others conservative is about protecting mm -hmm. and ensuring. But here is usually they tell you about the individual. They tell you this one is this, this one is that. I mean, so I think the problem that we have is also our party system, um, you know. But what I'm seeing now in terms of urbanized and, and, and rural, it seems to show that perhaps the issues that we are confronted um, is turning into ideological in the sense that why would rural communities, for instance, vote for an NPP? Uh, candidate is it because um, you know NPP is more focused on what interests uh, rural voters and comparing to the urbanites who uh, who believe that you know this party is perhaps the all they do is just promise and not deliver anything um, and here rural you know urban urban uh, in terms of education level in terms of income you know urban voters are not likely to depend on uh, a party for you know for for feeding or to receive money it's happening here I mean more people live here. But those things are not happening. But for me, generally, I think we have a problem with the party system. I think political parties must be able to, I mean, like we have national values. We have national vision. Uh, we can debate about that. But parties must be able to align themselves based on those. But today, you cannot separate ideologically. It will be very difficult to put any of these political parties on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. Most of them will talk about social democracy or, you know, other stuff. It was only APRC on the JAME where you can see these ones were more practical. I mean, they just wanted to uh, bring in development the way they saw it. And you can talk about DOI also, you know, they're definitely on the left side. Uh, but then the rest, it is very difficult to say this one belongs here or this one belongs there as well. So for us academics, I think it's, it's really challenging to, you know, to put the, these parties on a spectrum. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Um, um, talking about the rural, what, what do you think about this argument? The allure of incumbency is the one that maybe God put there. Yes. <laughs> that sort of thinking, <laughs> isn't it? So it will make a lot of people um, um, on board for them. So you, you said there's some really very interesting stuff that about the party system. Then how do we do politics? I mean, <laughs> but, but just look at it, like mm. just look at the National Assembly, you saw mm. that more people, uh, they were like, how many independent candidates? Because the About party is not here, 12, yeah, 12. 12. 12. and that was yeah. the, I mean, if you look at the history of this country, that might have been the, the highest. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? yeah. So it also, I mean, so it also points to the fact that people are not in line with the existing parties, to an extent you can look at that. Perhaps that's why parties need to reform, need to, you know, need to know what people are demanding and what will make people join uh, and be part of them. And because at the end of the day, you know, why base of a party is important? Because for elections like this, if you increase your membership, if you increase your numbers for elections where people are likely not to turn out, you mm -hmm. can mobilize your people to turn out and win. Mm -hmm. And still, we cannot talk about the election because oh, only 225% people turn out. It's still That's legit. Yeah. Yeah. It's legit Absolutely. and um, that will be, uh, you know, they will they will represent us. But that is that is the issue also. And in the rural community also, sometimes you go to certain communities, you know, like Yala mm -hmm. you know, that kind of mentality. mentality yeah, believe, but here, huh? but I also believe in education. I mean, I mm -hmm. think sometimes it is the education is the factor that can you know, ensure that all most of these things change. Um, in the and if you look at this country, the way it has been governed from colonial to now is almost very similar. You know, the government stays here. Mm -hmm. The rural community is just seen as a as a tail uh, that is usually not important, only important during election. And 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 so uh, in terms of communication or even civic awareness, they're not getting what they're supposed to get. Um, compared to here. Here they might not necessarily go uh, and attend any meeting for to get civic education, but mm. they're connected to the TVs, they're connected mm. to newspapers, they're seeing all these things that are happening and they are closer 
to what government is doing and they are seeing it from here. While those in the, in the rural communities, they don't tend to see. So they will not be able to evaluate. And then if political parties continue to preach one like is the incumbent, so incumbent will bring development. For mm -hmm. me, that's a, that's, a, that's a wrong analogy because at the end of the day, we have seen it. Incumbents, if they were to bring development, this country would have changed. But where are they? I just want to come in here. You, you talk about the independent candidates. In this election, we had 68 independent candidates. Mm -hmm. I mean, 58 were, were female. Let's now look at, like I said earlier on, APRC. In the last election, they had 18 candidates mm -hmm. that won, dropping to five. GDC, mm -hmm. from 23 to five. Mm -hmm. PDOIS, one of the oldest parties, was able to win only one. And not the alliance mm -hmm. is able to get seven. Mm -hmm. How do you analyze this, 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 this result? Well, I think it shows also that there are parties in decline. Of course, yeah. APRC, if you look at APRC and NOTO Alliance, mm -hmm. if they were together, mm -hmm. they might have, what now, 12 seats. Yeah. But because of the splinter, so now, I mean, um, the Fabakari, I keep saying that the Fabakari side has the papers and mm -hmm. the name of the party, but the people are with the NOTO Alliance. I mean, and I think that's the, that's the problem that, they, that those two parties have. Mm -hmm. But it also shows that APRC, once a ruling party now, is like, you know, is a fringe party i mean is uh, is is mm -hmm. five is very insignificant talking about 120 wards mm -hmm. for instance and they used to dominate all these wards um, prior so there's a decline for doi also clearly i mean they had like seven before but yeah. now they have one. one that also showed the decline of the party um, in national assembly they had um, four before in the last election they had only two so yeah. there is a decline in most of this party and gdc also there's a there's a decline and and, and so you can see um, from these numbers, basically. It, it, it's interesting. And going by these results, I mean, what does this tell about the, the chairmanship and the mayoral election? Well, for me, Can you I'm, use this to, to predict? I mean, what is yeah, I mean, for me, I'm saying like... I'm it's still open. Just <laughs> 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 no, for me, I'm just going to say it's still open. Okay. I mean, mm. as a student of political science, like, I need to be very careful. Yeah. But then in, in, in terms of when you look at the factors, it can tell you a little one or two things. When you take KMC, for instance, uh, for me, I always say that Talib has a uh, is has okay. a lead. Okay. Um, in the sense that, I mean, it's not only about the numbers that they're able to get, but it's backed by also things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And in KMC, you are likely uh, to have more independent voters, educated, tend to understand certain things. They might likely go and vote um, opposition or uh, Talib. In Banjul, I think still, I you know, it's not a strong belief, but I still believe that Rohi has a, um, has, a has a chance. It's also the pro the, uh, the 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 benefit of incumbency. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen, but at least um, those things are those things are there. Uh, Birkama. Uh, Birkama is going to be, be very, yeah, it's going to be yeah. very interesting because initially we were saying it was because between NPP and uh, and, uh, and and UDP, mm -hmm. but based on these results, if we were to look at it, then it seems like to be between the No Alliance um, and then and then the UDP in terms of those that have more seats because mm -hmm. NPP only get uh, I think one seat in, um, in in Birkama if I'm not mistaken two two, 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 two seats, seats two. Yeah. yeah then you have the No Alliance with seven, seven. Mm -hmm. so I'm not sure also of the overall vote because at the end of the day also the individual votes it's not okay. the seats that count but the individual votes mm -hmm. um, so who has the popular vote also that that matters I'm waiting for the IEC to uh, and, and that. we have seen that in in most of these wars the results when you look at the margins yeah, it's, it's very narrow yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. when we discussed it yeah. I, I said to you. I am not sure how much we can extrapolate yes. from yeah. this, yeah. you know, in, in relation to the chair, the mayoralty and, and, mm -hmm. and the chairmanship. It's very um, um, yeah. serious. You really cannot tell. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen any correlations. But but earlier on, talking about the, the political landscape, I will put this proposition to you. Mm -hmm. The way our system works, when DOI PDOIS came up in um, 86, 86 mm -hmm. It was against Jawara, Doi PPP. Yeah. Then afterwards, things moved on. Both of them are actually receding now. Mm -hmm. We had UDP came up to confront APRC. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it was. That was the historical moment, mm -hmm. as it were now. Both of them are gone. Mm -hmm. And you look at them through the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're there in the past. Now with the NPP, do you get the sense that we need a new kind of leadership, a new kind of opposition, mm -hmm. a new kind of party, as it were, to be sort of NPP's opposition, just as we've been saying, which mm. each party, its new era, it creates its own new yeah. party, like NPP, but mm -hmm. again, it creates its own 
opposition. Yeah. Do you get that sense that mm -hmm. there's an opening, particularly one that would rally the youth, yeah, the yeah. largest segment of our population, mm -hmm. not politicized, not quite yeah. yet, waiting to be tapped? Mm -hmm. What do you think? I mean, I mean, uh, politics is politics evolves. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you just uh, highlighted, mm -hmm. and and I think we might see that, but. Also, you realize that there are already existing parties. Some parties have even tried to do that uh, with the opening. You know, we we saw nine political parties before. Yeah. I mean, now we have what, 19, eighteen, 19 and some of them even now. did not did not present candidates. Yeah, yeah. So that's a possibility, but I'm not seeing it happening now. I think um, here until 2026, the main opposition is going to be the UDP mm -hmm. um, because they are. I mean, they are doing the work. You know whether they have declined in terms of the numbers that they had from 62 to 45 now, uh, but they're still doing the work yeah. and, and they're on the ground. So it will help them to 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 become that. But if it is between UDP and NPP and there's a third wave, I mean that comes in, that might be uh, problematic for both po political parties, and and that also needs to be need to be considered. But how yeah. that's gonna come up? What kind of leadership? What kind of issues they're gonna talk about? Um, it's not gonna only be you that oh young people come together. Uh, that's not going to be everything. It mm -hmm. must be beyond that. It must be nationalistic in 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 a way. That way you can capture um, all these people that are frustrated about the entire political system. And there's a lot of those that are existing. And whether you call them independent, swing, whatever you call them, I mean, they don't want to be um, part of this um, established political um, party. So so there, there's a there's a huge. Um, demography out there that needs to be tapped. How about mm -hmm. the older voters also? You know, there's also a significant um, demography that needs to be But maybe they represent the old ways. These are the people who are within, I mean, who, uh, yeah, who, who do this patronage. Same, All yeah. they know is patronage, clientelism, that, yep. that sort of thing. That's what they know. So maybe we need, we need this new, younger voice more vigorous. Mm -hmm. They have a political purpose, for instance, saying stuff like, all this corruption in public office must, must stop. stop. Yeah. This is our revolution. Mm -hmm. Surely we need that kind of voice. I mean, definitely, if that kind of voice <laughs> yeah. come up, I, I think now, especially, I mean, I wouldn't want to call it populism or so, mm, yeah. but sometimes, you know, those things uh, tend to work in such situation. But um, for me, I think also, you also see like more young people um, tending to join, you know, being in opposition, for instance. But you also see that young people are not homogeneous at all. Yes. I mean, like, we can talk about yeah. these ideas, but then if you compare also um, the issues, mm -hmm. you have more uneducated, young, illiterate young people mm -hmm. compared to those that are, that are literate, you know? Yeah, so so, so there is a, there are a lot of issues there, but for me, I want to see um, political parties, the established political parties reform. I mean, um, I, I, I tend to be more of a reform guy than a revolutionary, ah. you know, <laughs> guy, because they exist, and they've, they, they're there, they're already there, so... Within the parties, can they have internal party democracies? Can they bring in this new energy? Can they bring? Uh, ten, can they look at it themselves more in a nationalistic um, way, where they try to capture everybody? For me, I think those are the issues that we might have to have to look at. But if things stay the same way that they stay, if a new person comes up with the new with the right messaging, I mean, I think it will. All these parties will be chasing after that. And talking about all these reforms, I mean, mm -hmm. what should be the role of the civic education here in this state? Mm -hmm. Civic education is central. I mean, I think that's where also the, the gap is. Um, you know, that's why I was saying those that are here, they tend to be closer to the information, they access the information, they have a uh, clarity. But those outside, I mean, the, the, the rural community, it's very difficult they have to, to reach those. So where do they rely on? Radios and TV. And even going there, engaging them also is expensive. So for me, I think civic education is central, and that's why the, cent the National Council for Civic Education needs to be empowered um, to, to also be able to help people understand not only about voting or participating in election, but understanding the institutions, their functions, and why people must take ownership of those institutions. And that so far is missing. But the National Council for the Education is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, heavily underfunded institution in this country. But they have the most important role of providing unpoliticized civic education to the public.
And this is also um, very critical. But of course, we also see in a lot of civil society coming in. Yeah. But even the civil society, we need to uh, build their capacity. What kind of you know civil education are we providing? Is it partisan or you know? So there is need for an unpoliticized civil education where people understand the institution so that they can they can take charge of their own institutions. For thank me, I think that's, th yeah. th Thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Mr. John. Mr. Watch, uh, we, I know the discussion is quite interesting. We'll go for a short break, and when we return, discussion continues. Do stay tuned. Espas Motors is the largest and most modern auto service in the Gambia. Espas Motors is the only authorized dealer in Chevy. Mercedes-Benz trucks, Mercedes-Benz buses, Kia, Ford, Futon Mini and Midi buses, Futon trucks. At Espas Motors, we have qualified professionals who use modern technology to diagnose and repair all brands of motor vehicles. Espas Motors services include auto sales, auto repairs, vehicle painting, availability of high quality spare parts, towing services. We are reachable at any time. Call Espas Motors on 352222-353-4444 or locate us on the Bertel Harding Highway. Espas Motors. Hello viewers, welcome back from Dust Shot Break. You remember you're watching uh, QTV Syrup Affairs. Uh, I am Aliou Sise, here with my co-host Mr. Mudumbush, and our guest this week is Mr. Seth Matijau, who is the Executive Director of uh, the Center for Research and Policy Development. We're discussing uh, uh, the, the, the uh, local government election uh, results, uh, which show uh, the National People's Party uh, won uh, with uh, 52 seats, UDP 45 seats, APRC 5, uh, NRP 4, GDC 5, PDIS 1, Independent 1, and of course, not Alliance uh, with 7 uh, seats. Now, uh, uh, Seth, before we go on the break, you, you talked about, earlier on you mentioned, you, you were turned to your comparison between the two campaign managers, uh, Modu Sabali of uh, the United Democratic Party, and of course, I mean, that of the NPP. What do you think the NPP should do now to be able to change the status quo as far as KM and West Coast is concerned? I mean, uh, I, I don't know what, I mean, I don't give free advice. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't give free advice, Wise. but I mean, they are, you know, they know what they want. Maybe I mean, you, you should send an invoice to yeah, Bosano and is, uh, Chairman. I mean, but they, they, you, you see, you see there is, uh, you know, Sabali, for us, we can say that Sabali raised us because yeah. when we were started activism, long since he yeah. was part of that. Yeah. And that is the difference for me in terms of the campaign managers. Yeah. And he understands the political, you know, terrain, yeah. and uh, of course, in terms of education, um, you know, he is here, and then the yeah. other guy is there. Yeah. So that also counts. That's, uh, but UDP didn't do well from sixty-two to forty-five. But they didn't drop. I mean, of course, they they are opposition. Drastically, yeah, they dropped. dropped. They dropped, but then still, there's a good number. That's that shows number. that they still, you know, are, are a force, an opposition yeah. force to be to be recognized. But you will say that I mean, of course, clearly, there's a shift in terms of who dominated the the the, the council yeah. because now you see in terms of the numbers um you see that npp is 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 doing well the NPP so alliance alliance um so so in in that case then yeah um so npp now and this kind of reflect uh, what is happening at the national level also mm -hmm. that npp mm -hmm. as a as a new party is still is still strong but as an opposition yeah. with 45 I mean, that's still a very, very, very good number. 25 I mean, out of 120. 120 is a okay. very good number. And, and, and what about UDP in, in the provinces? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, well. so UDP needs to also do well in the provinces. They, I don't know. I mean, they need to, uh, I don't know what NPP is doing there, but they also need to learn, learn from that. But for me, I think it has to do with um, the, the understanding uh, and also the um, perhaps patronage um, that also mm -hmm. exists because patronage is when people talk about patronage you only talk about the exchange of money but it's also the clientele uh, you know it's also about promising that of Absolutely. course if you vote for us that this is gonna mm -hmm. that this is gonna happen and of course here this they say opposition is gonna do certain things that you want mm -hmm. so to get development you have to vote for the the incumbent and we hear we keep hearing all, all those stuff but for me, I think all these different political parties, um, first, where parties don't invest also is voter education. Mm -hmm. You know, you hardly see, maybe in to their camps, they do the voter education, but the parties must involve in those kind of stuff so that they can help um, um, people to come out and vote and perhaps they can benefit from those. But they don't, they don't do those kind of stuff. So for me, I think both parties also need to, um, to think strategically 
And sometimes some of these parties will tell you that in politics you cannot get everything. Maybe they have also their strategic aims, what they want to control and what they not want to control. So that is also up to them. So let them just um, know that the people own their votes and they will vote for whoever they like. Yes, um, earlier on, uh, earlier you talked about you know, the National um, Civic Education yeah. um, um, and Council and what it can do. But how would you respond to this argument? Um, certain cultural trends, the underlying, that undercurrent mm -hmm. of, of what we are, if we take, for instance, gender issues. Yeah. There is so much talk about gender issues. Mm -hmm. Wherever you go, yeah. gender issues, we're talking about that. Mm -hmm. But institutionally, mm -hmm. in, in terms of um, our conduct, changing behavior, our action, mm -hmm. it's really not happening. Yeah. I mean, a lot of go around, people will tell you, yes, women this, women that. But even here when I discuss and, they, and some of these younger uh, boys, our staff, they're much younger, mm -hmm. but they're more conservative than we yeah. are. <laughs> it yeah. seems we grown up, we are, <laughs> we are more progressive than they are. So what does civil education do vis-a-vis -vis these deep underlying cultural norms? Yeah. You know, the mistake that this country or oh, men, if I, mm. if I can say that uh, we make, is like we feel like the, the, the burden of this country should rely, you know, entirely on our own shoulders. Mm -hmm. You know, we have like um, uh, more than half of the population are women. You just look mm -hmm. at the registered, 58% yep. or 57% registered voters are women. Mm -hmm. So it shows the, uh, the important role that women... Uh, and majority of the voter turnout were women as women well. Women as well. And so, we are only 58 who took part in this, in this yeah. election. So, 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 there, so there are those issues. One, women are not given that opportunity to be educated in this country because the, 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 that's where the, the, the other problem is. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see, like, if you look at certain data, you can see from primary school, junior, um, you know, there you see more women. But by the time you get to tertiary, which is supposed to be the next level where you can leave university, leave tertiary education and get employed, you see less women there. So they yes. cannot be in offices like like men so some will call it the patriarchal society or whatever they want to call it but i think we have a problem and that problem is that we cannot push the development that we're supposed to push in this country if we refuse to continue to educate our women you know because that is very critical if we if we don't do that we continue to have problems and that's why um you know you see the, most of this problem uh, even the fear to contest in elections because they need to build that confidence they need to build that confidence to, so that they can have that but i mean uh, I, I think the, also the other problem is the, the the way that this gender issue has also been discussed as mostly between men versus women we don't see it that way i see it first like we are all gambians first uh being gambian then it requires that all of us have to work together yes. and that's that's what's uh, and uh, talking about that issue i mean will you suggest for example we we have laws being passed that will compel political parties to you know give women you know to contest on, on their parties but not only contest but put them in winnable seats i mean today look at look at you know parties they have strongholds you know mm -hmm. parties have strongholds if parties uh, today, there's, you know, you hear some people say we'll have 30 percent here, we'll mm -hmm. do this, we'll do affirmative action. But you have strongholds. You know, your stronghold will definitely vote for you, whether you put for a boy, baby or whoever you're going to put for. That should be an opportunity to put more women candidates uh, in, in, within those kind of strongholds. But I also, even though I don't like tokenism, but I believe our current situation, we need to inspire and empower people. And that's why we also need to have some affirmative action within our more structural laws. It's not to be entirely there, but for to, to, to help address some of these gaps that we have. And what the short term measures, the affirmative action, especially when it comes to the National Assembly, um, having you know, more women um, participating there, what that does is that it will inspire the younger generation also to, to look up to uh, women that are representing them and say so we quota want to be there. Yeah, like the, yeah, system. quota system. Yeah, quota system. But it's just general. a temporal until we are able to, you know, bring everybody at par, you know. And, and where it should start also is at the family level to ensure that women go to school. Young girls are taken to school and not only at school, but also taken all the way to university because they have a role to play in society. It's not just to be mothers and to take care of the homes, but the development of this country also need them. And because right now, if, if you look at the, 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 the figures, uh, you will observe that, I mean, of all the aspiring candidates, area councils, there's only one woman. That's Banjo, Rohilo, yeah. if I'm right. It was that's also the situation last, exactly. last, last year. Well, yeah. you know, today you look at Rohi Malik, I mean, she inspired a lot of young women. Yeah. 
You know, she's not only the mayor of Banjul, but also the president of, of Rafla. Rafla. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so gender issues are critical, mm -hmm. uh, especially for a developing country like us. Mm -hmm. Advancing that, because it's also about justice, it's about also equality. And when we do those things, we see, we see the benefit. Look at, look at Rohi. And Gambians are generally very, uh, very intelligent. And mm -hmm. when we go internationally, I mean, we tend to do well. Mm -hmm. But in country, you know, we always do poorly. I, I don't know what the issues are, but <laughs> perhaps... And, 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 and you have these women also, they absorb the gender stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. There are certain expectations from your culture, from yeah. your own society. Mm -hmm. When you combine that with the lack of economic power. Yeah. So these are some of the reasons why you wouldn't see, for a while, you wouldn't see lots of women in politics. And, and, it's, mm, that's and what people fail to get also is the economic power. Mm -hmm. That is the most important element. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because when you want to run for office, like Amikoli, I give example of Amikoli, Honorable Amikoli. Yes. I mean, she's self-financed, mm -hmm. you know, because she had her own business and she used her resources yes. and yes. get involved in politics. And today she's serving the entire country. Yeah. But most women will, without the resources will not want to get involved in those things because, mm -hmm. I mean, elections are expensive. We make it unnecessarily expensive. And so it requires a lot of money. But how do we also fix those things? I mean, put a cap on um, campaign financing and all those things would also help bring more women out because also the uh, women will likely sp want to spend more money on the family, mm -hmm. which they don't have, than, you know, using it and get insults. Like you said, I mean, you were observing the elections. I mm -hmm. mean, I know you must have read some of the reports about uh, some sort of inducement, yeah. voter buying here and there. There were allegations, you know, other responding, denying those allegations. Did you at any point came across those stuff, voter inducement, voter buying? Well, I think, you know, the fact check center did, did some fact checking on those. Um, and I think one of those um, was confirmed by the election watch committee mm -hmm. that both NPP and UDP candidates, I think it was in Talending, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, maybe they can clarify that, uh, were involved in that. And so it was fact checked and it, it turned out to be, you know, to be accurate. So so those are those things are part and parcel of our politics. And that's why I'm always a big fan mm -hmm. of um, campaign financing. But, you know, there needs to be a whole act that regulates, you know, political parties, the way they engage. But citizens, for me, what I don't understand is why would somebody come and give me chicken change? 500. You know, <laughs> 500 is too much, sir. You know, give me chicken change yeah. and then expect me to, to vote. I will, for me, you know, since I cannot stop people from giving, I will take and then go and vote the way I, I'm, I'm supposed to vote. We see that happening in some places, you know. But the idea is parties must discourage that. But here also, they say if you don't give that, People will not. But vote. what guarantee do you have yes. that if you give Mr. Boy 500, Mr. Boy will vote for you? Ah, yeah, car, you know, it can be you. <laughs> <Mr. Boy. laughs> it's a secret ballot. That's what I always exactly. say. That's, that's the reason it's why it's a secret, secret ballot. ballot. It's a secret ballot. Yeah. <laughs> so, so people, you know, we need to have that conversation so that people can understand these things. I mean, if they cannot stop giving, take, but then go and vote the way you vote. But then there, there was also a case in Banjul. Mm -hmm. I mean, that one, I think the challenge. Um, for them to confirm that has to do with, you know, getting information from the police because one of the report was that the police arrested, um, arrested that person. But yeah. still now we're not sure whether the police arrested or not. So those are, that's why it is also important for, for, for fact checkers and, you know, government officials to be, um, to be engaged. Because when we know the fact, it can also help, um, you know, sanitize our politics, you know. But mm. yeah, and money, money should not be a determining factor for me in election. It should be about the issues. And, you know, we have to force parties to raise those issues. You, you, of you earlier on spoke about, when you were talking about the issue of the civic education, you talk about the role of the civil society. Mm -hmm. Many at times, I mean, the, the CEOs also have come under attack for being one way or the other, being seen to be aligned to the opposition. What, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, here, uh, first, I mean, being a civil society does mm -hmm. not make mean that you are not a Gambian. Exactly. You are a Gambian force and then you have a right to, to vote and then to support. But then what we say in terms of even people in government, they belong somewhere. Mm -hmm. But your job should be to be neutral. Like you have to be seen to be neutral. I mean, I vote, I have a candidate that I, that I choose. Mm -hmm. But in public, I will never support any party. I will not support, you know, I will not talk to anybody and support any political party because my job is to try to bring everybody together. And when you are trying to bring everybody together, you must show that neutrality. And, and I think for, for civil society, 
and and ho- here also in the country, not necessarily that civil society might, you know, it's perception also, yeah. not necessarily that they are doing that, but because politicians want to yeah. discredit you and they will ping pong you all over, they will put you in this group. And when you say certain thing that is critical to them, then they become, you know, you automatically they are enemy. Yeah. But for us, you know what I keep telling the younger ones, you don't care. As long as you're doing your job and you're doing it for uh, based on your concern and for this country, just do your job and then focus on that. And, 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 and so at the end of the day, you see before the noise was too much. But now I think, you know, civil, civil society also has a voice and we, we speak back. And those are the ways that we can, um, you know, neutralize those. But we need to also work internally, work with ourselves, increase our knowledge, our understanding, so that we'll be able to communicate more, especially in terms of our mandate. You know, today I am civil society, tomorrow I can leave and then be anywhere. So so that also is just a job and most people see it more on a voluntary basis. So there's nothing, I mean, um, um, that should worry them about what other people are saying. As long as they're focused, they're doing their job based on what they want to do. Let me just twist it around a bit. <laughs> is um, civil society becoming the Republic's loyal opposition? If I can put it that way. <laughs> well, I mean, for, for us, uh, I cannot speak for all the civil society, <laughs> but at least for us. But, but generally, when you look at the trend, they, they, they tend to go hard on the government. When the, go- when the government gets wrong, when I put it that way, yeah, rarely yeah. would I see anybody come and say, oh, the government got, got that one right. And I when I <laughs> listen to an independent voice, I expect to see this randomness. Mm-hmm. If I see you consistently being, yeah. you know, on one side, then there's something wrong. Yes. <laughs> so yes. if I see sometimes you support, other times you don't, I trust the voice. So when it comes to public issues and the way we engage with public issues, especially controversial issues, um, you know, uh, people differ in terms of that. But then the other civil society might criticize government openly or not agree with certain things. But today, civil society continuously try to work in partnership with government. They are sitting, we are attending their meetings, we are discussing, we are even debating way more than we engage in, 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 in the public. And so civil society has dual role. I mean, we are we are only accountable to the citizens because we are as, as a citizen group we should be accountable to no, the citizens you're accountable to those who fund you are accountable well, to the funders that, is, that, that must is, be that a factor that as well but then we are asking for money on behalf of the people so therefore if we get the money then the account we must ensure that it gets to the people you know we are not coming to do service delivery so us, our engagement is more on civic education is more on doing research for instance um but those are the things. But you accountable to the funders for what? Then if any civil society is doing that, they need to rethink. You know, that's why the other time we organized a Twitter chat where we need to rethink about the role of civil society in this country. This country is democratizing, so we really need to rethink. We need to, um, you know, improve ourselves. We need to uh, increase our knowledge. We also need to be strategic in terms of the way that we engage. For me, I will agree with that. But that we are accountable to our donor. Maybe there are some. But for me, if you want to give me money and control me, you'll not get me. Well, he I who mean, pays <laughs> the piper. <laughs> the tune. Okay. Okay. We'll be okay. paying ourselves. Uh, exactly. <laughs> say, say now, now, now let's now move on to something uh, very important that is now uh, being debated: the, the mandate, the tenure of the chairman of the Independent Electoral Commission. When does it was supposed to end this year? But according to a media report we've we, we've read, I mean. It's now saying 2025. How do you react to this? I mean, I think there is lack of transparency in the entire process. I mean, I mean, the IC chairmanship is not an individual's office; it's yeah. a public office. And public office, there must be transparency, accurate information being peddled. I mean, being shared with the public. Mm-hmm. Today, nobody can tell you um, when it started or when it will end. I think there's a responsibility of government, especially the person that appoints. Because, you know, today, if we're talking about the chairmanship of the, um, the IEC, whether his time has expired, what that does is also is creating problem. It is creating, it will increase people's distrust in the, in the institution itself. Because people are saying, maybe your time has expired. But mm-hmm. what for me, I think what is missing, uh, and, and you know, the right to know they've been following this case since 2018. I mean, I'm, ten, I'm moving more towards accepting their claims until and unless we see a more authoritative and, you know, uh, uh, clear. But the government is not doing that. The IC is not communicating. Today it was 2023 and now we are saying 2025. I mean, this country needs to be taken seriously and our institutions need to be taken seriously. If the constitution say this is what's supposed to happen, we ensure that that happens. Outside that, you know, we can do our views and do something. But for institutions like IEC, this issue of the chairmanship should not be an issue right now. The government must clarify and, and, and so that we move forward. And, and that's the thing, isn't it? Even the chairman himself 
in 2020, yes. everybody can access that yes. report, yes. that interview he did with the standard. He said that 2023, yes. his term would, would, would come. And to everybody kept quiet. Everybody kept quiet. And now 2023? That's it. He, now they're moving the goalposts. Oh, is it possible so it, it, it is renewed? That's it. It has without... been extended by oh. the executive to 2025, but under what powers? The executive had no power outside the seven, you know, the 14 years. I think the, 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 the entire yeah, time supposed exactly to be 14, 14 years. Yeah. And outside that, they need to appoint somebody new. And even for me, that's why I argue that the appointment process of the IEC chairman needs to be, you know, the, the parliament needs to be involved. Involved. Well. Yeah, because the IEC is the most, it's an independent electoral in, in, uh, commission. So the independence the, there needs to, be, um, needs, to be, needs to be strong. But for government to come and then they're abusing the law. Why would they abuse the law? And then if everybody also abuse the law, what would they say? Because they think like they have the appointed power. They don't have the power to appoint somebody beyond the uh, 14 years. And that's why they need to come out and clarify. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 but then for me, the, the other point is that why is opposition political parties keeping quiet? Why is the parties keeping quiet? Because these are issues. At the end of the day, they want to blame civil society for not talking. But these are things that they also need to talk about. I mean, what, what are they going to do about these issues? You know, they, they need to be part of that. And today, they cannot say that they are not in parliament, they are not in places where laws are being made. They are there. There is a need for them to, to also engage in this process. Because if we get our electoral process right, I mean, our democracy would be, you know, would be envy of the entire continent. Or maybe perhaps the executive is happy with the work he is doing, despite his age. Some people are saying, I mean, even if not for the... For, for for the mandate, I mean, looking at his age now, he's old. He's old just well, like I mean, that. I don't want to get into a younger, <laughs> the discriminatory yeah, aspect. As yeah. as long as you are Gambian and you feel like you're able to do it, yeah. yes. But if your time expires yes, and it's creating controversy, first we need to clarify. And if that time expires, the time expires, not based on the age, but the time expires. And if the time expires, that's it. You know, like there are two million Gambians at least. And, mm -hmm. you know, you need to get people to do, to do the job instead of bringing all this unnecessary distraction. And now we're going into the, like I said, the mayor and the chairperson elections. How are you approaching the elections, especially your office, you know, the Center for Research and Policy Development? Well, we are part of a CSO coalition on election, and we also have partnership with um, various civil society organizations. And for elections, we tend to work collect collaboratively mm -hmm. um, um, with those individuals. And one of the things that we continue to do is to engage, like, engage the media, public, raise awareness, because these are important things that we have to do. And as an organization, our uh, our focus is people-centered development. We can you can call us at leftists, whatever you want to call us. Uh, but we want to we want to ensure that at the end of the day, people have a say in the governance process. And so we'll try to monitor the processes. We'll try to support um, institutions that are working on fact-checking because fact-checking is also critical. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of here politicians as long and so people need to start to to do those kind of work and and, and for us we are very committed in those processes and you know if we feel like there are certain things that are happening and we can take measures we are willing to take those measures and uh, for us we want to help and support the consolidation of democracy in this country and and, and that's that's our goal that's all what we want because in a democratic society we believe everyone will have a voice and then we can easily engage and then avoid all these um, uh, distractions and, and conflict. And here, early on, you're a reformist. Mm -hmm. you know, he, yes, he calls himself a reformist and more of a revolutionary, I have to say. <laughs> 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 you, you talked about local government. Do you think that to make local government relevant, we need reforms, don't we? Clearly. Huge, massive reforms in there to, to make it relevant. In what direction would you see these reforms? I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I've been arguing. Mm -hmm. First, for me, the starting point should be a constitution. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a new, I mean, right. you know, you talk about new democracy, there must be a new mm -hmm. constitution. Mm -hmm. Unless we are all democracy, I mean, in a color, uh, new democracy, old constitution. Nah, mm -hmm. a new democracy mm -hmm. must come with a new constitution. Mm -hmm. So the constitution must anchor all this reform process that we're talking about. But the good thing that the 1997 constitution also did is that it says that um, local governments must be devolved to the people. Mm -hmm. And here, this is where also we're interested, like people-centered development. So for me now, um, what you need to look at is to what extent has this devolution taken place? To what extent are local councils um, independent or autonomous? Um, financially, we know to an extent they are, but not entirely 100%. Administratively, um, I mean, politically, they get elected, um, but 
outside, you know, there you can say that is hundred percent being elected and though. But administratively, I mean, you you elect a chairman and the next minute is the central government that appoints the CEO yeah. or somebody. And we've seen the problems that it is causing. They can see. You know, and sometimes local government service commission. Yeah, local which government. Tends to yeah, their appoint do these do things. those kind of appointments. So I think at the at the at the local level, of course, local government and central government must continue to work together. But I feel more power should be given to the local councils in terms of um, what they can collect, in terms of revenue, uh, but also, um, you know, uh, the monies that are supposed to come from the central government must also come to them. Because, and, and, and for me, I also think like central government want to be everywhere, yes. like the education, health. Sucks. I believe this um, local Sucks. government should be at the local level, at the national level, they should be responsible for those kind of services. Um, today, KMC is responsible. Basically, they support Charles Jow. I don't know if they yeah. own Charles Jow or so. Like, that is the model that people mm -hmm. that in other communities that should. Absolutely. Because people then should be able to hold these elected leaders directly for not providing mm -hmm. uh, those basic stuff. And mm -hmm. what that does is also it pushes yeah. the focus from the central government to the local. And that's, that's where accountability th comes th in. Th thank you so mm -hmm. much, Asset <laughs> Matijao uh, uh, and Mr. Mbot. Well, viewers, uh, with that, we bring an end to this week's edition of the Sierra Affairs program. Uh, our guest was Asset uh, Matijao who is the executive director of the uh, Center for Research and Policy Development. Uh, we, we were discussing, I mean, the, 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 the local government election. I mean, Chair Marit, once again, thank you so much for coming on the program. And Mr. Moch, it's always good to have you on the program. Yeah. Well, viewers, uh, do join us next week. Until then, bye-bye.